The sermon text for this evening is Matthew 11, 28 to 30. So you're getting a bonus verse according to the uh, screen up there. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we come to you as those who are weary and heavy laden. As we consider this promise that you've given us in Jesus Christ, by your spirit, help us to hear these not as mere human words, which don't have the power to lift our spirits and secure for us a hope of rest. But Lord, by your spirit, enable us to hear these as your words to us. And in that, to receive the words of life. And we pray this in your name. Amen. If you're here this morning, there's some interesting parallels between um, our passage tonight and the sermon this morning, which Paul and I have tried to represent in matching shirts. Um, In this short passage, we have a particularly memorable statement from Jesus, a beautiful and comforting summons to rest. It's it's also a statement that in the text seems to drop out of nowhere. It comes right after Jesus pronounces woes on the cities that he's done miracles in. So if we want to appreciate this little meaning-packed statement, then we need to consider the Old Testament background, the the rich themes of rest from the Old Testament that it's built upon. So to begin with, we're going to consider a a short biblical theology of rest from the Old Testament, which hopefully won't have too much encyclopedic detail. When you do your PhD on a topic, it's, you know, it can get a little much, so hopefully it won't be. So there's two distinct strands of the rest theme in the Old Testament that work like two great rivers that flow through the Old Testament. The first rest theme is that of the rest of the Sabbath. That's the one that will be more familiar to most of us. We could say it's the time of rest. On the Sabbath day, Israel is summoned to cease from their labor and to rest. They're called to give rest not only to themselves, but to one another, to those who are in service to them, to their animals, even to the land itself. This day, this day of rest, is identified as a covenant sign for Israel. It's not just a day, but it's something that's meant to orient their whole lives before God, a bit like the Lord's Supper does for us now. The day is also part of a wider pattern of rest seasons. The people are called to rest, to observe a year of rest every seventh year, And in every 50th year, they're to observe a jubilee, a a year not only of rest, but of restoration. When those in servitude are freed, debt is canceled. These two, these seasons of rest, must shape how we understand the promise of a time of rest. The Sabbath command to Israel is not a command to cease all activity. In its original contest, the focus is on work, on the activity that we do to provide for ourselves uh, and for others, on obligatory activity. So we should not understand rest as mere inactivity per se. The Sabbath is set apart as a day unto the Lord. In breaking from the ordinary patterns and concerns of lives, of their lives, the Israelites are called to recognize that they belong to God. They're called to rest in the special relation that they've been given with God. I will be your God and you will be my people. Think back to the first reference to Sabbath in the Old Testament, Exodus 16. When God provides manna for the Israelites in the wilderness, He tells them to gather six days and to rest from gathering on the seventh. And he provides extra on the sixth day for them. So already in Exodus 16, we see this connection between rest 
and God's provision. The day of rest is meant to be a day for God's people to be oriented to God's provision, to recognize his provision and entrust themselves to him. And it's rest that allows, it's God's provision, excuse me, that allows the people to rest. In Exodus 20, with the first giving of the Sabbath command, Israel's called to remember that God himself rested on the seventh day of creation. Now, this, of course, does not mean that God became exhausted and needed recuperation. Rather, it speaks to God's completing the tasks that he ended to do, intended to do in, in the work of creation. God does not cease to be active in the rest of the seventh day or withdraw from creation, but rather he sets a clear mark in the seventh day that he has completed the work he intended to do, and it's very good. He has accepted it, and now creation is ready for the purposes that he has for it. Later, when the Sabbath command is given again in Deuteronomy 5, this time God calls the people to remember the Exodus, to remember that they were slaves in Egypt and that God has brought them out of slavery with a mighty hand. The Lord saw the suffering of his people and he has rescued them from their heavy labor. So rest is grounded in our recognition of God's work, not our own, both universally in creation, but also his special works among human beings to redeem them and to summon them into relation with himself. In rest, we celebrate God's work with thanksgiving. We enjoy the gifts that he's given to us and we entrust ourselves to him for our future. All that God commands to his people is to be conditioned by the truth that God is not like Pharaoh, a cruel taskmaster who puts heavy burdens on the people in order to give himself rest. In the Babylonian creation story, the gods created human beings to serve as slaves for themselves so that they could rest. But in stark contrast, the God of Israel and the God of the church needs nothing, he lacks nothing, and is full and complete in himself. God has rest with and in himself. And so for this reason, God can offer rest to us. He doesn't need us. He's not, he doesn't give us instructions and tasks to exact something from us or to, um, for his own benefit. Even though the Sabbath is commanded, it is not another work for us. Rather, God's people are summoned to rest, recognizing both the work of God on our behalf and also his lordship over the entire creation, including not only our work, but our whole selves. This is the first theme of rest, the Sabbath rest. The second is just as pervasive in the Old Testament, but it's often more overlooked. We've heard a lot about it in the readings tonight, and that is the theme of a resting place. This develops over the course of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. The promised land is frequently identified as Israel's resting place. This makes sense given the arduous journey that Israel makes through the wilderness to reach the promised land, their destination. God's people are images as sojourners on their way to their true home, the place they will come to be at rest, the place at which they'll finally be able to say, we have arrived and we need no longer seek any other end, any future destination, any better state. Again, here with the land, we see the connection between rest and not inactivity, but completion. Yet the land is not identified as a resting place for Israel just because it's the end point of a, of a trip. Rather, it's a resting place because in it, God will provide reprieve from the people's heavy burdens. They will be given rest from their enemies from servility and conflict. Yet even more positively, it's a resting place because it is a place of fullness and wholeness. 
It will be a place marked by abundance through God's provision. Yet we must not under, misunderstand why the land is identified as a resting place. It's not merely a nice place to live, a pleasant set of conditions. It's nothing intrinsic to the land itself. Rather, consistently through the Old Testament, the promise of a resting place is connected to the presence of God. Before even departing Sinai, this close association of God's presence and rest is created. In Exodus 33, 14, following the sin of the golden calf, Moses appeals to the Lord not to send the people on without him by themselves. And he says, and the Lord responds to Moses's plea, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God will bring Israel to its resting place and preserve her along the journey through the wilderness. The land will be a place of rest because God will rest there with his people. This is why over the course of the Old Testament, the land is closely connected to the temple and God's presence in the temple is closely connected to rest. The the temple is identified as God's resting place, the seat of his presence. In Psalm 32, David promises to build a resting place for the ark, a temple. Of course, we know that God doesn't live in buildings. He can't be confined or constrained to any physical location, as Solomon himself reminds at the completion of the temple. So rather, this language of God's resting place is not a statement about God's existence, but it's about God's choice to freely associate himself with his people to be Israel's God and to make them his people. Verse 13 to 14 of Psalm 132 reads, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Just as the holy God's choosing to associate himself with Israel makes Israel a holy nation, not because of anything in themselves, but because of his presence. So also God's choosing to rest with his people will make the land a resting place. It will transform it, causing his rest to radiate through the land. Finally, this theme of a resting place is also connected to the kingship of David, as we saw in that Psalm, and as you see also in 2 Samuel and Chronicles, in 2 Samuel 7, David is identified as the instrument through which God will subdue Israel's enemies and bring rest to the land. It is the king like David who is promised to in the future subdue the chaos that encompasses the land and finally restore rest to it. As we'll see in Matthew 11, this connection between David, the Davidic king, and rest is important. But before returning to Matthew, we have one final word of background to consider. And that is with the benefit of hindsight, we know that the promised land did not end up being a resting place for Israel in any lasting sense. As we've already seen, rest was tied to Israel's relation to God. And so as Israel turns from God, so the land turns from a place of rest to a place of turmoil. And ultimately even the people lose their place in the land. As recorded in the historical books of the Old Testament, Israel's history ends up being marked by pendulum swings between times of rest and times of conflict and suffering. The people repent and turn to God after their idolatry and after they suffer because of it. And God will give them rest and restore them. Nehemiah 9 recounts that God blessed Israel with houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchard, and fruit trees in abundance. Nevertheless, Nehemiah then goes on to lament, but after they had rest, they did evil again before you. Over the course of Israel's history, rest is shown to be something that 
human beings can't secure for themselves, just as they cannot overcome their own sinful patterns and alienation from their creator. Throughout the prophets, Israel's forsaking of the Sabbath command serves as a general sign of their overall forsaking of their relationship with their Lord. God's people labor ceaselessly and exploit the labor of others. They seek to secure their fortunes through the worship of false gods. They seek alliances with hostile powers. And in forsaking rest in God, God's people find themselves toiling for nothing and suffering under the consequences. So over the course of the Old Testament, the promise of rest becomes increasingly tied not to a present reality, but a future hope, one that starkly contrasts the present. It becomes clearer and clearer that the promise of a resting place looks beyond the promised land, as we heard in Hebrews and in the Psalm 95, to a greater reality to come. Both of these themes, Sabbath rest and a resting place, increasingly get connected to the expectation and hope of an age to come. The age ushered in by the Messiah is portrayed by Isaiah as a Sabbath age, an everlasting jubilee. Further, Isaiah connects the theme of promised land as resting place to the age to come. In the age to come, God will not only redeem his people, but he will renew creation. The promised land was just a shadow of the new heavens and the new earth, the final resting place of God with his people. So hopefully it doesn't feel like we've taken a whirlwind tour of the Old Testament, but all this background serves as the foundation for our verses, for how we understand Jesus's promise to come to him and find rest. Matthew's gospel draws together two distinct messianic themes. Jesus is pictured as both the suffering servant of Isaiah, but also the king like David. And Matthew doesn't just present Jesus as these two things separately, but he blends these two pictures into one unified picture. Jesus is the gentle and lowly king. It's no accident that in the very next passage after ours, Jesus identifies himself with David just before declaring himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is also identified by Matthew as Emmanuel, God with us. He's not only the king like David who will secure rest for God's people from their enemies and establish peace. He is also the ultimate fulfillment of the temple. In him, the presence of God rests with human beings. Because Jesus is with us, he can call us to himself to find rest and to find a resting place. Jesus summons all those who are weary and heavy laden. Now, we might wonder who are the weary and heavy laden in view in this passage. This phrase looks to a broader theme in Matthew. Jesus shows great concern for the poor, both those who are literally poor, but also those who are poor in spirit. He shows great concern for those who are sick, both those suffering under disease, but also those who are suffering under the sickness of sin. He shows great concern for those under burdens by those in authority over them, as we'll see later. So this term should be taken in the broadest sense possible. Jesus calls all those who are weary and burdened to himself. And that may lead us to then ask, what exactly is being promised? What is this rest that we can find in Christ? First, notice that Jesus says in verse 29, to learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus serves as both our example and our teacher. Our verses come directly after Jesus' statement that it is not to the wise, but to little children that the mysteries of God are revealed. Remember the rest of the Sabbath. God's people were called to cease from their labors and to entrust themselves to God. Think also of Jesus' call in Matthew Matthew 6.25. 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And his reminder that our Heavenly Father knows what we need. Jesus not only teaches us this, but he is our example. He is the Son of Man, the representative of true humanity, what it means to live as a human being, humbly dependent on our Father. He demonstrates that the life of rest will be a life of prayer. Jesus is not only the one who teaches us to trust in our provider, but Jesus is also our provision itself. It is through Jesus, through the Son of God, that God holds the whole universe together. It is through him that the Father provides. And in fact, Jesus is the greatest evidence of God's love and provision for human beings. For God did not spare his own son, but gave him to save us. So in the first place, we can see that Jesus gives rest through calling us to entrust ourselves to our Father, to come as little children. In this, we are freed from our great burden. We are freed from the wearying labor that follows from believing that our lives are purely in our own hands. Of course, this is not the ultimate sense of rest, as we've been alluding to throughout the service. Teaching us to rest in God's provision is part of how Jesus offers us rest. Yet we still live in a world marked by restlessness. Our work and service will sometimes feel like heavy burdens. We face bodies that wear out and we face death. Is there anything that causes more unrest in us than the thought of death? So we have this provisional sense of rest promised to us in Christ. Yet there is also a more ultimate promise of rest. As with the Sabbath command, rest addresses our relation to our work, to the material world, to one another. Yet it also addresses our relation to God, and it speaks to our whole existence and future. So let's consider how Jesus bears our burden and promises a final resting place. As we've already discussed, Jesus is the Davidic king, the one who comes to rescue us from sin, suffering, and death, and to establish for us a resting place. He is the gentle and lowly servant who bears our burdens for us, both our suffering in this life and the curse of sin. He is the good shepherd who protects his sheep, lays down his life for his sheep, and will bring us to restful pasture. So Jesus not only offers us reprieve, rest from the weariness of this life, he offers the promise to an end of all weariness, to an end to the sin and death that robs us of rest. He offers the hope of a final state of completion in the new creation, a place of wholeness and abundance where God will rest with us and we will rest with God. Jesus bears our burden. He bears the burden of our sin, suffering, and death in his life, death, and resurrection. And he not only bears our burden, but he gains victory over them. This is what Jesus can do that no one else can do. So Jesus secures for us through his own work our hope of a future rest. He not only did all this, but as the living Lord Jesus helps us in our journey towards this final resting place. Our hope of rest in Christ isn't just something about what he did in the past, but it's about the present activity of God in our lives through Jesus. As Hebrews tells us, he sympathizes with us in our weakness and he intercedes for us. He has given us his spirit to empower us, to preserve us amid the toils and trials of life. In all these ways, Jesus continues to secure for us the hope of rest. Just as the Sabbath was grounded in the work of God and creation in the Exodus, so now the promise of rest is grounded, not in our work, but in the work of Jesus Christ. We just read from Hebrews 4. Hebrews 3 through 4 is a helpful passage for thinking about how Christ secures our hope for everlasting rest. 
the passage pulls together both the rest themes that we discussed from the Old Testament. Drawing from Psalm 95, the author identifies the new creation with the promised land and identifies it as God's rest. And in 4.9, it speaks of celebrating a Sabbath rest in this resting place. The world to come will be a place of rest in which God rests with his people and we can rest with him. Yet, as we read, the author of Hebrews warns us not to be like that first generation of Israelites who, after passing through the wilderness, reached the edge of the promised land. And because they lose faith in God, they turn away and do not enter the resting place that he has for them. The author urges us, do not fail to enter God's rest, but strive to enter it. But here it's valuable and quite essential to consider the unique form of striving to enter rest that the author of Hebrews has in view. How is it that we strive to enter God's rest? Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 concludes, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then hold, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So striving in this case does not amount to some great achievement on our part, some monumental task that we must um, work ourselves up to be able to handle. Rather, our ability to rest in God is grounded in, again in Jesus's work, not only his death and resurrection, but as we saw in this passage, his ongoing priestly office where he sympathizes with us in our weakness and he helps us through the Christian life. In this way, ours is not an arduous task, even in the journey towards God's final rest. Rather, our chief task, the light yoke that we bear, is to hold fast to Christ. So we are not only called to entrust ourselves to Jesus for our daily bread and for the rest within the burdens of life, We are called to entrust ourselves to Christ in order that we may come to enter God's everlasting rest. In the last chapter of Isaiah, God questions, where will his resting place finally be? And he answers his own question saying, it will not be in a building, but rather with he who is humble and contrite in spirit. So having considered this promise of rest that Jesus has given us, let's consider two forms of heavy burden that this passage addressed. Let's see the contrast to this rest. Only one other time in Matthew does this language of heavy burdens gets used, and that's in Matthew 23. There Jesus warns the disciples and the crowds about the scribes and Pharisees and the heavy burdens that they place on the people. He says, They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Now, Jesus, of course, does not exactly lighten the load in one sense. Uh, He doesn't lower the bar when it comes to the standards for God's people. Think of the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus lays out the picture of what it means to live in a way that's fitting to the kingdom of God. It's a picture that's very appealing, but it's also incredibly daunting. So some might ask, does Jesus actually give us a lighter burden than that of the Pharisees? Now, part of the issue is that many of the burdens that the Pharisees have placed on the people don't actually come from God. So that's part of the issue, and that differentiates them from Jesus. That's to say nothing of their own hypocrisy or the lack of mercy that they show to people when they fail to live under up to the standards. Yet more importantly, as our passage highlights that we just read, the key difference between the Pharisees and Jesus is that they refuse to lift a finger to help. 
this is a significant reason why their burden is so heavy and yet Jesus is, is so light. When we cannot fulfill the calling that God gives to human beings, he takes the burden on himself and fulfills it in our stead. And even now, as we seek to follow his example, he helps us. Jesus fulfills the words of Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The turning of our light burden in Christ to a heavy burden is often subtle. Take the Pharisees' zeal for the Sabbath. And yet in their zeal, they turn it from a day of rest into a day of work. They forget that the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. And so we must be careful not to do the same. We must be careful not to turn Jesus' call to the weary and heavy laden to find rest in him into another form of work. It is possible even to render the gospel a heavy burden when we misrepresent it. We can come to see the promise of grace in Jesus Christ, not as a free gift that's received in faith, but as a second chance that we must seize and secure ourselves. It's possible to render the call to witness to the coming of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ as instead a burden to bring the kingdom ourselves. Or we can render the call to witness to salvation and thanksgiving to a burden to save people ourselves. We should be watchful that we are not like the Pharisees, placing heavy burdens on others that we cannot carry ourselves and without lifting a finger to help. Jesus also invites us to recognize the difference between his yoke and such unreasonable burdens. There's the fitting claim on our lives in him, and there are false claims on our lives, those that are not intended for our good, but are driven by selfish and corrupt ends. And it's important that we differentiate between rightful claims on us and the wrong ones. That's the first heavy burden that this passage addresses. And this, there's a second one, though, that's more subtle. It's paradoxical. And that is the burden that comes not through the imposition of strict duties, but in the denial of any claim on our lives. For in attempting to throw off any yoke, we find ourselves burdened with a heavy one. The pop icon Taylor Swift recently was awarded an honorary doctor by New York University. And in her graduation speech, she gave this charge. I know it can be really overwhelming figuring out who to be and when, who you are now and how to act in order to get where you wanna go. I have some good news, it's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news, it's totally up to you. Now, I don't raise this quote primarily to criticize. I think there's a certain wisdom that she shows in recognizing the great burden, even the frightening burden that comes with the responsibility to decide who you are and how to get there, how to become who you want to be. Now, we must acknowledge that this freedom and obligation to make choices for ourselves is a part of life. God grants wisdom, but he doesn't tell us what to buy at Tesco or what to have for breakfast. He doesn't even directly tell us big things like what major to choose or who we should marry unless we're Isaac. We do have these decisions to make within the parameters that God establishes, but we have this responsibility to make choices. But that's not what's in view here. Instead, what I have in view is the rejection of any outside determination, not only on what we do, but who we fundamentally are. Our decisions are meant to be limited and directed by God. And not just in the sense that he gives us instructions. On an even deeper level, in creating us, God has given us a specific existence. He's made us particular kinds of creatures, 
for a particular relation with himself, with one another, with the world, and will only flourish within the existence that God has given us. Autonomy promises openness and limitless possibilities. Yet the gospel would counter that autonomy does not bring freedom, but another form of enslavement. Such a wholly directed life is a life without grace. We will never be truly recipients if we're truly autonomous. We will always be laborers. We will even have to become like our own creators. Our lives will be like the world at the opening of Genesis, formless and void. And if God is set aside as both creator and perfecter, then the great toil of forming and filling the void will be left to us. So the promise of the gospel does entail embracing a yoke, as we see in these verses, a a claim on our lives and responsibility before God. Jesus directly couples this promise of rest with the call to take his yoke upon him. But of course, the order is important. Jesus promises rest and calls us to embrace his yoke. God brings his people out of slavery in Egypt and then gives them the commandments. And as Jesus reminds, his burden is light, and in it we will find rest for our souls. God does not saddle human beings with burdens that are to our detriment and to his benefit. Rather, God is our creator who knows us better than we know ourselves. So perhaps it is the case that it's not all up to you, but perhaps that's a very good thing. It could be that embracing our creator's claim upon our lives It will not be a burden, but actually a source of rest. In conclusion, Jesus' summons to rest is a summons to entrust ourselves to him, both our work and our whole lives. He has promises that he will help us, that he will care for us, and ultimately to bring us to a final place of rest. This promise, though, is for today. In our present lives, we can rest in the work of Jesus Christ and his promises. We can experience a peace that passes understanding, a rest amid the restlessness of the world. When we recognize God's work and we entrust ourselves to his care, we can even experience a transformation of our work. There is a a sense in which we can rest amid the service that we do. Yet, at present, we still suffer. None of us will perfectly entrust ourselves to God every day. We will experience anxiety once again overtaking us. And we'll again and again have to be called to learn from Jesus. Moreover, we will experience the weariness of this age. Though we rest in Christ, we have not arrived at our final rest. Christ reigns, and yet we do not yet see the world as a place fully marked by his reign. We still wait for the end of our sin, for the end of suffering, of alienation, and ultimately the end of death. We wait for the return of Jesus Christ and the everlasting rest that we will share in the new creation. That is not a hope against hope, a fantasy. But rather, in Christ, we not only have the promise of that future rest, but in Christ, we have the revelation of that rest. Just as he has been raised, so will we. Just as he shares in the Father's rest, so will we. And so, like him, we trust our Father, and in so doing, we don't have to wait impatiently, but with hope and security. And we can work, not wearyingly or with a feeling that our future rests in our hands, but rather we can serve in the knowledge of the Father's care and the Son's work on our behalf. To close, I would like to read a few verses from Psalm 107, a Psalm of David. Psalm 107, 4 through 9. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. 
He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things.